Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen. We thank God for this opportunity to worship him today in spirit and in truth. Uh, we should never take it lightly that God has given us another opportunity to sit and to worship in this sacred spot that we call University Presbyterian Church. Amen. 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 We thank God for this new series that we're beginning on First Peter, a peculiar people living in hope and standing in grace. Uh, Peter is one of my favorite uh, apostles of, of the Bible because he reminds me a lot of my, myself. Uh, uh, I, I grew up uh, loving to fight. <laughs> I know y'all don't believe that about me, but uh, I was called a fighter growing up. And I was one of those kids who would uh, get in trouble in school and we had a fighting ground in the back of the school and I would tell the people, tell the, a young person, young man, meet me in the fighting ground. And uh, I was the kind of kid who, you know, would draw a line and if that person crossed that line, I would punch him. I'm just trying to, you know, I'm having a come to Jesus meeting with you this morning. <laughs> and, and so God, God took the, the hatred out of me and, and made me a lover of people. Uh, and Peter was, was, was like that. He, he was a zealot. He, he was, uh, for lack of a better word, Peter was the Malcolm X of his day. Uh, he, 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 he would use the knife first and then think later. But Jesus made a lover out of Peter, that he loved the people of God. And here in 1 Peter, we see that reality coming to the forefront. Uh, the Peter in the Gospels is completely different than the Peter that we're reading about here in 1 first, in first Peter. Uh, something has happened. Something has changed in Peter's life. And so we're going to look at this passage today, and I do invite you to stand as we read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. And we can uh, read this together. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Gaius, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen and destined by God the Father and sanctified by the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ, to be sprinkled with his blood, May grace and peace be yours in abundance. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials. So the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that was to be yours made careful search and inquiry, inquiring about the person or time that the Spirit of Christ within them indicated when it testified in advance to the sufferings destined for Christ and the subsequent glory. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in regard to the things that have now been announced to you through those who have brought you good news by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. 
Amen. That was a long passage of Scripture, wasn't it? <laughs> Amen. You may be seated. The benefits of a living hope. The benefits of a living hope. Dr. Jonathan Wilson wrote a very thought-provoking book that I have been reflecting on in preparation for this series. Uh, on, on, and it, it's, it's entitled, Gospel Virtues, Practicing Faith, Hope, and Love in Uncertain Times. He has a chapter that is called in this book, Hope and the Christian way of being. And in that chapter, he writes, we are desperate for hope because all the sources of hope are crumbling. The Marxist hope has faded. Even democratic capitalism shows many signs of instability. Unemployment, racial conflict, uncontrollable violence, drug use, and moral decay are threats that we cannot deny. How can we recover the hope that our world so desperately needs? It is our, is our hope grounded in the human spirit and in the power of human intervention? Does hope sustain us by giving us an alternative to the world? Is our hope grounded in the human spirit and human powers? Or is it grounded in the Holy Spirit and the work of God? Dr. Wilson expressed the sentiments of First Peter. This group of believers who is composed of Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians have come together throughout the diaspora, and they want to know if there is any hope during Peter's day. And Peter, who I would call an apostle of hope, uh, he's been through some things. Jesus has taught him some things, and he speaks life into that early church. Uh, they're under immense persecution. They're going through a lot. And Peter has been through a lot, and he speaks hope into this dispersed groups, group of those who are in exile. And I want us to understand today that Peter is speaking hope to us as well, because when we look at the society that we live in, we may be asking the same questions. Is there any hope? Uh, can we put our hope in the human spirit or in human leadership? Peter seems to be saying to us today that most importantly, we must put our hope in a higher reality of who God is and who Jesus is and the work that he has done. But he also tells us that there are some benefits of this living hope that God has given us in the person of Jesus Christ. He shares with us what hope looks like, that hope is a Christian way of being. It's a mindset. Uh, if anyone has a sense of hopelessness and they're not uh, they're not Christian. They ought to be able to come to you, and you ought to be able, I ought to be, a, be able to give them a sense of hope. Amen? Amen? So what does this passage teach us? I'm glad you asked that question. First of all, we see in this text that the hope that Peter is referring to is a hope that we are born into. That we are born into. Look at what Peter says here gives a very vivid description, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the exiles of the dispersion. This word exile can be translated foreigners, strangers. Uh, dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen, destined by God the Father, sanctified by the Holy Spirit to be obedient 
to Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood, may grace and peace be yours in abundance. What Peter is, is, he's building them up. He's helping them to understand that that you're, you're not of this world, that you are exiles by choice. This word exile comes from the Greek word peripitamos, and it refers to one who lives alongside a side of a sojourner. The word is used of those who are temporary residents not permanent settlers in the land, those who have a deep attachment and a higher allegiance to another sphere of reality. This word emphasizes both alien nationality and temporary residence. So Peter's helping them to understand that I want you to see the big picture that you're, you're not of this world. You, 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 you have an allegiance to a higher reality. You have an allegiance to, to Jesus Christ. And so you are, as Stanley Howard points out, you are resident aliens. You're not to be comf- comfortable here. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. So here... Peter helps them to understand because they're, they're, going, they're under immense suffering. Nero has his foot on their backs, and he has blamed the Christians for the burning down of Rome because he wants to build a new Rome. And so he, he, they become the scapegoat of what he has done. And so over 10 successive emperors, the Christians have been, will be under persecution all because Nero has made them the focal point of what has happened in Rome. And Peter speaks into that social reality and gives the early Christians, that's why they are dispersed, that's why they're part of that diaspora, because they are now marginalized. They are outcasts. They have become, they are referred to as a Christian sect that has fallen under Judaism. And here, Peter tells them that you are born into this new reality, that you have the triune Godhead that is overlooking and and making sure that you you have the spiritual stamina to make it through these uncertain times. So he, he goes on to, t- to tell them that you, you've been chosen. You, you are elect. You've been set apart. And, and that means that God has them set apart for his own unique purpose. They have been set apart to be a trophy, a conduit of God's grace. They're elect. We're, we are elect. Now, we don't use that word uh, today, but it, it does not negate the reality of what the Scripture says about the people of God. You know, I have this, I have this, this, this blue bowl at home, and it's, you, it, it's, we have other bowls, but for the past 16 years, I've been eating oatmeal out of this, this blue bowl. And my wife knows not to touch that bowl. Amen, somebody. (laughs) Every morning, I put my oatmeal in that bowl. I put my almonds in that bowl. I I put my flaxseed meal in that bowl. I put my blueberries in that bowl. And every morning, I eat out of that bowl. And one of the things about that bowl, it has affirmations in it. Round the bowl, it says, you are great. You are wonderful. You are marvelous. You're going to get through this today. And so that bowl has been set apart. I've chosen that bowl out of the pink bowl and the white bowl and all the other bowls. That bowl is the bowl that I use for my own specific purpose. And such is the case for us as Christians. God has set you apart. He set me apart. 
And every day you, you are the apple of God's eye. You are precious in his sight. He has his eyes on you and on me. And, and we're, God wants to use us for his own unique purpose. This is what Peter is saying to the early Christians. You, 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 you are not an afterthought of God. You are, at, you are at the forefront of God's mind that God has you on his mind and on his heart. Amen? So he said, you're born into this hope. But he goes on to say that you have been born into this, that there is a new birth that has taken place. And this new birth suggests that you have new parents. You have a new family. The triune Godhead is a family uh, in the purest sense of the word, and, they, and the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit has brought us into the family. We have been adopted as sons and daughters into the family of God. I believe it was Cyprian who said that no man can call God his father if he does not accept the church as his mother. The implication behind that is the church is that, that place where we are raised, that we are formed, that we become, that we become mature followers of Jesus Christ. It, it is that place where God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son begins to raise us and make us fit for the master's use. Oh, what a beautiful reality to know that God has our best interest at heart. So it's a hope that we're born into, not only that, but it is a hope, it is a lively hope, where God is our power of eternity, of, of, a power of attorney, excuse me. In other words, God has, has Assume the responsibility to protect us, to provide for us. God has assumed the responsibility to guard us. And so look at what he says here in verse 4 and 5. He says, and into an inheritance, well, let's, let's start at verse 3. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be, to be revealed in the last time. Peter gives us three prepositional phrases here. It says, into a living hope, into an inheritance, and for salvation. So these three prepositional phrases implies that, that God has, we, we have become beneficiaries of the finished work of Jesus Christ. That we can't add anything to it, we've got to receive it, we've got to take it all in that Christ bequeathed to us all that he has accomplished and that we have become recipients of the salvation. The salvation is free to us, but Jesus had to pay an awesome price for this salvation. So the, the reason this is a living hope is because Jesus is still alive. That Jesus lives. We just celebrated Easter that he just, that he got up and declared that all power was in his hands. And so this, 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 this living hope that we're referring to, Peter Edwards points, it, points out in his commentary that hope is a confident expectation of a good outcome based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Hope is centered on Jesus, and since Jesus is alive, this can be identified as a living hope. And Jesus is the personification of hope. In other words, the hope that we profess, the hope that we believe in, is, is inculcated in the gospel. That when we 
talk about the good news, we're talking about hope. When we talk about the good news, we're talking about a messianic hope that Jesus has finished the work. All we have to do is receive it and walk in light of that reality. So he says, you you have a living hope, but not only that, that you have an inheritance. An inheritance is something that is given to family members. Uh, Some family members may be too too young to receive that inheritance. And Peter seems to be implying it in this this passage in 1 Peter that we have to grow into this inheritance. Uh, That we don't receive all of it now, but we, we receive it gradually as we mature and become aware of who we are and whose we are in Jesus Christ. Sometimes God has some things for us, but we're not ready to receive them yet. Sometimes God has doors he wants to open for us, but we're not mature enough yet. And so Peter talks about desire, the pure milk of the word, but you can't stay on milk. You've got to get to meat. And being the good father God is and being the good savior Jesus is, he will not Uh, give us an inheritance that we're not totally mature enough to receive. We have to grow into that inheritance. And so God has the the power to protect our divine investments. God alone provides, protects, and produces an eternal weight of glory to be revealed when Jesus returns. He is our power of attorney. He works pro bono for those who have accepted the finished work of his son, Jesus Christ. In other words, salvation is free, but it came at a great price to Jesus. (laughs) And I'm so glad that God works pro bono. (laughs) Amen? Amen? That God doesn't charge us for the spiritual work that he's done in our lives. That God does not charge us for the salvation. He does not charge us for the sanctification. He does not charge us uh, for the house that he built. This is really God's house. So he provides. He protects for us. Here's the thought I want you to think about. When we think about our new identity in Christ, I want to encourage you this week to, to reflect on this passage and to make a list that describes your new identity in Christ. Meditate on it when you feel down or feel hopeless. Remember that you are chosen, that you are, you are elect, you are an exile. Remember that you have been, God has done all the work in your life, that God has destined you, God has sanctified you, God, ha- God, wa- God has Pour the life and the success of Jesus on you that when God sees you, he sees Jesus. Reflect on that this week when you feel down, when you feel feel out. Obviously, Peter had to reflect on that in his own life. God was there. God was restoring him. But I love what Peter says in verse 6. He says, now for a little while you may how to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. He, he, he talks about suffering. He said, in this you rejoice. Even now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials. So the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold, that though perishable, is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus is revealed. There's an eschatology, eschatology that, that, that Peter is referring to, that the eschaton, that, that we, we, we are futuristic as Christians. We look beyond what we're going through, knowing that there is a greater reality that awaits us in the future. And so Peter helps them to understand that that your suffering has a shelf life. That your suffering, there's a purpose to the suffering. There's a, there's a, that God is shaping us and molding us into the image of Jesus Christ. And nobody 
invite suffering into our lives, but unfortunately that is the, the chisel by which God uses to shape us into the image of Jesus Christ. But here's he, here, look at what he says, that your faith might be genuine. That even though you haven't seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable joy. Peter seems to be implying that trials produce an authentic and genuine faith. Trials perfect our faith and shape us to make us fit for the master's use. Every teaching that Jesus poured into his disciples would eventually be tested. And just as the word became flesh in Jesus, so must the word become flesh in us. That we must live out the word of God. It's not enough to have a head knowledge of Jesus Christ. We must also have a heart knowledge of him. God expects us not to only proclaim the gospel, but to embody the gospel. So this this hope that we have is a lively hope. This hope that we have points to a greater reality. So the, the trajectory of our faith walk is working out an indescribable and glorious joy. In other words, as we walk by faith, Jesus is with us, directing, leading, and guiding us into a deeper reality and thereby drawing us closer to him. Now, I know sometimes it it doesn't always feel like Jesus is with us, but I, I would suggest to you today that our faith is not based on our feelings. Our faith is based on spiritual facts that Jesus has declared in his word. When he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, he, he's saying that you, you can trust my word over your feelings. You can trust my word over how you might feel insecure sometimes. You can trust my word that, that my word will carry you when you can't carry yourself. And so Peter understood this. He had to let Jesus take the lead in his life mentally and spiritually. He had to learn the the art of followership. Such is the case in, in our own faith formation. To follow Jesus means you have to unfollow self. As Pastor George talked to, talked to us about unfollow, that we have to unfollow self. In other words, we have to trust. Jesus more than we even trust ourselves. I don't think many of us have arrived there yet. (laughs) But that's the the role that we're on. In order to be a great leader, you have to be a great follower. Peter had to learn this. To follow Jesus means you have to unfollow self. Self can get in the way of what Jesus wants to do in you and through you. I think that's why, you know, when we think about John the Baptist and when John says, he must increase, I must decrease. What John is saying in his own life is that, Lord, help people to see less and less of me and more and more of Jesus. That should be our prayer today because people don't need to see you. They need to see Jesus. They've seen enough of you. They've seen enough of me. They need to see more of Jesus, and the more people see Jesus, then they want to know about the hope that is in us. Peter had to learn this because he had too much confidence in himself and not enough confidence in Jesus. So that's why Jesus began to take Peter on this journey so that he would have a genuine faith Because what happens in our faith formation is that God raises, just like uh, he talks about this, this refining process, God raises the impurities out of our lives so that we can have a genuine faith. Those things that are impure, that are not like Jesus, jealousy, envy, strife, 
God wants those impurities to come to the surface so that we can have a genuine faith. This is what Peter had to understand that sometimes trials come to show what we are made of. It was Shakespeare who said in his 53rd sonnet, what is your substance? With what are you made? Sometimes trials come to find out what we are made of. He did that to Abraham. He did that to to David. He did it to Joseph. Sometimes trials come to, to figure out, to find out what we are made of and to give substance to our faith, to give credibility to our faith. So Jesus is the subject and the object of our faith. Jesus says that there is a blessing for those who have not seen, but yet they believe in him. Like Jesus, Peter remembers what Jesus said and encourages his readers with the same words. The Holy Spirit gives us joy and confirms with our spirit that Jesus is real even though we haven't seen him. We are gathered here in this sanctuary today for the specific purpose to say that Jesus is real. We, 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 we gather for prayer, we gather for worship to declare that we serve a risen Savior. We gather today just like that marginalized community, that the diaspora of Christians that was composed of Jewish and Gentile Christians to give substance to our faith as a community. Here's what I want to say to you today. This, this is just one suggestion for application in the midst of suffering. Try to see beyond the here and now to the glorious future you have with Christ. That in the midst of suffering, whatever your, your suffering looks like, try to look beyond the here and now and say, Lord, there's, there's a greater reality to, to this. There's, there's a redemptive reality to this, Lord, that the suffering that, that we're going through, as one writer said, God doesn't waste anything in our lives. He takes the good and the bad, that all things work together for those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. And he reminds us today that the prophets, kings, judges, Peter looks back on salvific history and said that Jesus was there all the time. <laughs> he was in the prophets. He was in some of the judges. He was in some of the kings. That Jesus was making his way to us all the time. And that's the beauty of the gospel, that Jesus never gives up on us. He never gives up in saving us and redeeming us. This is the reality of it all. Paul talks about this living hope and standing in grace, that when we read 1 Peter, we see hope on the front end and grace on the back end of, this, of, of 1 Peter, chapter 1 and then chapter 5. But Peter has become a man of hope, a man of grace. So resolve to live your life today in a way that conveys Christ-centered hope so that you may be an authentic witness to his glory. Resolve that today because the world needs to see Jesus and you may be the only Jesus that the world will ever see. You know, when I was at my former church, there was an old deacon there, Deacon Kelsey, he was 95 years old, and he was a church custodian. He, he set up tables. Anytime we had an event, he didn't want any help, so he would set up 20 tables and chairs, and he had a method to it. But it finally came to a time where Deacon Kelsey had to stop doing all of this, and so his, his family called me and said, Reverend Williams, our dad won't listen to us. 
We told him that he needs, to, he needs to stop doing this. He needs to retire. He'll listen to you, Reverend Williams. So I called Deacon Kelsey into my office and said, Deacon Kelsey, you know, we need you to mentor someone else to do this work. Your family came to me and told me that you need to stop doing all this. He looks at me, this twinkle in his eye, and this grin on his face, and he said, Reverend, they don't understand that I'm a grace man, that I don't do this for a paycheck. I do this because of grace, that God's been good to me. I do it because of grace. And even when he stopped, even though we had someone else showing up to set up the chairs and close the church, he kept showing up at 10 o'clock at night. And he would always tell me, I'm a grace man. I thought about that and I wondered today, are there any grace men and women here in the church today? That the reason you do what you do is because God has been good to you, that God has been gracious to you. Are there any grace husbands, grace wives? Are there any grace elders, grace deacons, grace ministers? Are there any grace ushers? That the reason you do what you do today is because God has been good to you. That's what the world needs now. We need more grace people. It's too much hatred. That's too much people charging too much. We need to say, this is, this, is, this is an act of grace because God has been good to me. I better stop right there. I'm getting, getting a little excited. <laughs> but Jesus, Scripture tells us that grace and truth <laughs> came by way of Jesus Christ, and the things that Jesus did was, was an act of God's Jehovistic grace in our lives. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the benefits of a living hope that we've been chosen, we've been sanctified, we've been set apart that we were born into this hope, that this thing is bigger than us. Thank you, Lord. Lord, there may be somebody today who needs to know that, that you want them to be born into this hope, to be born again, to belong to the family of God. So, Lord, would you touch somebody right now? Give them a profound understanding that you died for them too, that you rose for them too. Lord, would you touch right now? Would you give them that understanding that Jesus came, that, that they might have life and have it more abundantly? Lord, we thank you for the work that you've done in our lives and continue to do. And we give you the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.